bucket courses, everything you want to know before you kick the bucket. Uh, my name is Barb Lease, and we're so glad to see all of you here. Uh, here are some things you need to know before we start. Please silence your cell phones. If you have a T-coil, turn your T-coil on. If there is discussion or if there's time for questions, we will bring around the uh, microphones. If you're able, at the end of the program, if you could put your chair up, there's dollies at the front and the back. Okay, now for the main event. Greg Thielman is a 1972 graduate of Grinnell College, from which he received an honorary doctorate in 2009. And he is a 1975 graduate of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. He served in the US Foreign Service for more than 25 years, specializing in arms control and security issues. At the time of his retirement, he was the acting director of the Strategic Proliferation and Military Affairs Office in the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. After retiring from the State Department, he worked for four years on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence before joining the Arms Control Association. His areas of expertise and research include threat assessments, nuclear missile proliferation, and U.S.-Russian strategic arms control. Greg Thielman's resume of service to the United States and his distinguished career could fill another 10 minutes of this introduction, but you can check out his Wikipedia page when you get home for more of his story. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Greg Thielman. Thank you, Lord. Thank you very much for coming this morning. Uh, I am honored that uh, I can not only see a crowd like this, but recognize so many faces. <laughs> and uh, I uh, intend to speak uh, for 30 or 35 minutes so I, we don't miss the break. And then uh, after that, that, I'll come back and have a few more thoughts on the subject. A and then can we can turn to questions. And I guess my first question is, uh, can everyone hear me all right? And if you, if you can't hear me, you can just wave your hand or something, and I'll probably notice, or maybe not. <laughs> My remarks today grapple with a question which has confronted our nation repeatedly since its inception. When is war justified? The quotation in my title, Great is the Shame of an Unnecessary War, was expressed by our second president, John Adams, more than 200 years ago. He was seeking to avoid all-out war with France at the end of the 18th century. Adams was not a patriot, but he was a reluctant warrior. President Adams' sentiment seems very relevant to policy debates in our own era. We have had wars aplenty, and looking back, it is hard to judge each one of them as necessary. By necessary, I mean vital to protecting our national security. So I'll take a short look at our long national nightmare in Vietnam and a longer look at our relatively short war against Iraq in 2003. These two wars are uppermost in my mind, although I'm not a veteran of either, they both loom large as bookends to my 25-year State Department career. The Vietnam War was well underway as I matured to draft age in 1968. It was also haunting my classmates throughout my years at Grinnell College and slightly beyond. I spent the summer of 1974 between my two graduate school years as an intern on the State Department's policy planning staff. Although the focus of my work was on the department's budget, I was also exposed to classified cable traffic, including from the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. In 
its over-optimistic tone prompted me to write an article for State's classified dissent journal, ironically dubbed Open Forum. And I'll see, <laughs> I'll see if I can uh, show that to you here. Okay, the, the purpose of this is just to give you a flavor of uh, what this o open forum document looks like. And it, it is interesting that uh, when I went back to graduate school, I immediately lost my clearance to allow me to read the article that I had written. So I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't keep a paper copy of this until 10 years later when I could get it declassified. And it was only classified secret. It wasn't top secret, but uh, such are the amusing... Uh, events. Now it's working, okay. <laughs> so, so I just uh, sh showed, I just highlighted a few of the things that I had written there at that time. It was clearly not something that one wanted to articulate too loudly since I was working on the same floor where Sec Secretary of State Henry Kissinger worked. And, <laughs> and I talked to the Asian expert on the policy planning staff about some of these uh, notions. And it wasn't that he uh, disagreed with me as much as uh, expressed gratitude that someone was available to say these things, but he certainly wasn't going to do it. Uh, so anyway, it was it, it was uh, very strange for me as as a I guess 23 year old at the time to uh, see reports that uh, our embassy in Saigon was referring to the aging leaders of North Vietnam that had lost touch with reality. Meanwhile, I was reading about, you know, the massive uh, reinforcements of North Vietnamese troops in South Vietnam and tanks, including tanks, and I thought there's something wrong with these, <laughs> these two comparisons, and that really was what motivated my article. So as I said, I was also uh, exposed to the classified cable traffic uh, including from Saigon. And I asked why the North Vietnamese buildup in the South was uh, being ignored. I asked why the future cost of, ec ec of uh, responding to North Vietnamese aggression was being downplayed. I argued that we were engaged in wishful thinking on a grand scale and predicted that the North Vietnamese were preparing for a nationwide general offensive. Six months later, after my analysis was distributed, the South Vietnamese government was overrun. <laughs> now let me touch on some painful parallels between Vietnam and Iraq. I realize that the Vietnam War is fading into history, but I want to begin with Vietnam as a preface to Iraq because I believe that misunderstanding and misinformation played a similar role in both wars. I want to focus on two critical episodes in Indochina's 10,000-day war. The first was the multilateral 1954 Geneva Accords. With nine countries participating, this agreement dismantled French Indochina, recognizing Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam as independent countries. Vietnam was scheduled to be unified under a democratically elected government two years later but the South Vietnamese refused to participate in nationwide elections, and the U.S. supported this refusal. Washington and Saigon had a variety of reasons for blocking that election. Foremost among them was the expectation that the winner of a fair election would be the communist leader of North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh. This denial by the U.S. and South Vietnam of the promised election helped set the stage for the military confrontation that followed. By 1964, a guerrilla war was well underway in the South, and South Vietnamese commandos had begun conducting raids on North Vietnam. Hanoi realized that the U.S. warships in the Gulf of Tonkin were supporting these attacks. On August 2nd, North Vietnamese torpedo boats were ordered to intercept a U.S. destroyer sailing near the site of an ongoing South Vietnamese attack. U.S. counterfire damaged the North Vietnamese boats. Another destroyer soon reinforced the first, and both were backed up by an aircraft carrier. 
On a stormy night 24 hours later, the U.S. reported a second attack. In describing these Tonkin Gulf events to the American public, the Johnson administration did not mention the clandestine raid on the North that had been underway at the time. Instead, the U.S. government characterized the action as an unprovoked attack on an American naval vessel sailing in international waters. Moreover, when Washington reported a second attack two days later, it seemed by, to the Congress and the U.S. public that Hanoi had delivered a real poke in the eye on top of its ongoing efforts to undermine the government of South Vietnam. The administration requested that Congress authorize a military attack on the North and the dispatch of combat troops to the South. The subsequent resolutions passed overwhelmingly, but the Congress had lacked information on two important critical facts. Members were not aware of the secret CIA-backed attacks underway against the North by South Vietnamese commandos, and they were not aware until three decades later that the U.S. intelligence community had made a serious mistake in reporting a second attack. The timing of signals intelligence was confused. This confusion and poor visibility had led to an erroneous initial assessment that a second attack had occurred. It had not. The Tonkin Gulf Resolution was the closest thing the executive branch had to a congressional declaration of war throughout the long struggle. The Vietnam War eventually had led to more than 58,000 American soldiers being killed. More than 3 million Vietnamese died in the 20 years of the, uh, following the Geneva Accords. And few would argue today that this slaughter was necessary to defend our values or to protect our national security. Great is the shame of an unnecessary war. The next war I will discuss is our second invasion of Iraq, a war justified by the charge that Iraq was continuing to make progress in developing weapons of mass destruction. This was contrary to U.S. nonproliferation goals and the explicit terms of the 1991 ceasefire. By this time, I was the director of the State Department's office which assessed such security threats, the Office of Strategic Proliferation and Military Affairs. But I had declined in the fall of 2001 to retire, I had decided rather, <laughs> to retire in the following year uh, after completing four consecutive years in the office. I had no idea when I made the decision that the U.S. intelligence community would issue an important national intelligence estimate the day following my retirement. This uh, estimate would be used to justify the invasion of Iraq. So I concluded my 25-year State Department career just as a huge public debate was opening up on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. I just missed participating in the rapid writing of an estimate on the various intelligence agency assessments. But the members of my office who took part in the September 2002 coordination of the classified estimate did a great job articulating our ongoing skepticism about how the evidence was being interpreted. There were two versions of this estimate an unclassified version for the public and a top secret version for those who had the appropriate clearances. I'll see if I can give you, um, I'm sorry I, I missed a, a chance to see the the first and only attack on our destroyers. Um, this it, it gives you an idea of what the covers uh, look like of the of the two versions of the report. On the left is the unclassified report, on the right was uh, the secret no foreign dissemination title and the top secret report on, on the right. And I just give you one sample of the key judgments, which is the introduction to the two reports. Uh, one of the curious things is that this statement here about INR's dissent, the State Department dissent on the critical first judgment, is not there at all in the public. 
it, uh, the public doesn't know that one of the all source intelligence agencies strenuously disagrees with the main uh, the most dangerous part of the report but there there it is not only that in addition to that initial sentence expressing disagreement there's a very long INR dissent which is I, I know from my experience very unusual usually a dissent is a one or two sentences explaining why one agency doesn't agree with this or that but this is rather extraordinary and it keys in on one of the most important parts of the report which uh, concerned the uh, the idea that Iraq was uh, restarting its nuclear weapons program so if I could have the light back on thank you So I, I was proud of the State Department analysts that had voiced well-reasoned and prominent dissenting opinions, particularly regarding Saddam's nuclear portfolio. But I felt it was important to let the public know that experts were divided on critical issues and that confidence levels varied on critical judgments. And unfortunately, the unclassified version presented the judgments as if they were facts and made no mention of dissenting op opinions. In this classified version, the State Department's dissent was highlighted in the first paragraph and in this long uh, section at the end. Ironically then, my last job of my Foreign Service career associated me with a clear dissent on critical intelligence related to policy, as had my first State Department job as a summer intern. My earlier dissent on Vietnam had criticized policymakers for being too optimistic. The latter dissent on Iraq's dominant nuclear program, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> on Iraq's dormant nuclear program, criticized intelligence analysts for being too pessimistic. But in both cases, the lonely dissents turned out ultimately to be correct. And the second time around, the mistakes became evident even more quickly. Weapons Inspector David Kay, who conducted a CIA-run inspection just three months after the invasion, declared, we were all wrong. Of course, I take exception to this unqualified assertion, <laughs> but, but, but there it is, uh, the cover of, uh, of Newsweek magazine and, and some of the uh, faces you'll probably recognize there. The, the only one who's not very familiar is David Kay on the top uh, left right right next to, to George Bush uh, but anyway that's the that's the dominant interpretation we were all wrong uh, most Americans appear to believe now that the 2003 invasion of Iraq was an unfortunate mistake based on faulty intelligence when we mark the 21st anniversary of the invasion 12 days from now you will undoubtedly hear reference to the errors of the US intelligence community in exaggerating Iraq's weapons of mass destruction programs. It is tempting, but too simple to attribute the invasion to faulty intelligence. After all, some of the alarm bells being rung then were appropriate. Saddam Hussein was a brutal tyrant who had per pursued weapons of mass destruction in the past. He had committed aggression against neighbors Iran and Kuwait. He had kicked out international inspectors several years earlier, and there were reasonable suspicions that Iraq was not in compliance with the limits that had been imposed on it. Moreover, I believe that Saddam would not have relented to permit the return of inspectors without the U.S. threat of using military force to back up the, invest the international community's demand. That having been said, it is also right to criticize the errors of the National Intelligence Estimate on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. Th this was an estimate published in October 2002. The estimate erroneously concluded that Saddam Hussein's government had not only continued to develop and retain chemical and biological weapons, but was in active pursuit of nuclear weapons. Each of these charges was mistaken yet they constituted the primary justification for war, a war that cost the lives of 4,800 Americans and 1,068 
168,000 Iraqis, a war that cost our treasury over $2 trillion, a war that undermined our, na our nation's uh, reputation internationally. I had worked for the only U.S. intelligence agency to have accurately assessed Saddam's dormant nuclear program. The State Department's dissent submitted by the office from which I had just retired was prominent and convincing. While the details of INR's analysis were classified, the conclusions were available to the U.S. Congress, and they were largely ignored. And by the way, I'll just mention that every member of the U.S. Con Congress has a right of access to these uh, highly classified documents, but sometimes none of their staff has a right, so they actually have to go to the to classified spaces and, uh, and, and read things and not just get secondhand reports. So as a recent retiree who had been involved in the classified analysis, I sought very carefully to apprise the press of this dissenting interpretation and its implications. But I was in a delicate position. I was hearing public statements I believed were false and which were raising the risks of war, but I had taken an oath to protect government secrets and worried about visits from the FBI if I was not careful. And I must say that I did not have the courage of Daniel Ellsworth uh, or his many other talents for that matter. I proceeded with caution to signal my skepticism about some of the claims being made by senior administration officials. I responded to journalist inquiries and and ended up being quoted that fall by U.S. News and World Report and Newsweek magazine. But I otherwise had little success getting attention. In January 2003, I thought I had found the perfect handle. The Linguistic Society of America had just designated weapons of mass destruction the most influential words of 2002. So I submitted a draft opinion piece to the Washington Post explaining why chemical and biological weapons, although illegal, did not belong in the same category of nuclear weapons. My draft also pointed to misleading statements being made by administration officials. But alas, my draft op-ed was not accepted for publication. <laughs> In February, after Secretary Powell's presentation to the UN Security Council, I tried again to make the case against invasion. More explicitly this time, writing as a native Iowan to the Des Moines Register's <laughs> editorial board. But again, my effort to place uh, an article was not successful. I finally found an audience with Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times. <laughs> I had sent him my reaction to one of his articles, along with my earlier draft uh, of the Des Moines Register piece. This prompted Christoph to call me on the phone for an interview. But this was five weeks after the invasion, when U.S. forces were finding no weapons of mass destruction. And based on our telephone conversation, he quoted me as saying, quote, the Al-Qaeda connection and nuclear weapons issue were the only two ways that you could link Iraq to an imminent security threat to the U.S. And the administration was grossly distorting the intelligence on both things, unquote. These two sentences opened up nearly two years of interview requests from television and print journalists, both U.S. and foreign. It was an interesting and professionally satisfying strut across the stage, but it was also a feckless one. It did not influence America's choice to invade without UN authorization. It did not prevent the president who ordered the invasion from winning re-election in 2004. But I'm still trying to influence how we remember this history. I would argue that our search for lessons regarding our second war with Iraq should not be limited to the October 2002 intelligence estimate. My preferred emphasis in is on what was happening four months later in the weeks prior 
to the March 2003 invasion. The October 2002 estimate drew attention to suspicious Iraqi activities. Saddam was refusing to honor the obligations I imposed on Iraq after its 1990 invasion of Kuwait. Iraq had expelled the international inspectors. Surveillance by national technical means, such as satellites, was insufficient to ensure compliance with Iraq's obligations. These circumstances and the, arms, the alarms raised by the National Intelligence Estimate led to the subsequent vote of the U.S. Congress to authorize the use of force. That vote enhanced international pressure on Saddam's government sufficiently to permit the return of international inspectors in November that he had kicked out of Iraq three years before. This goal was achieved four months before the invasion. The, inspection, the inspectors returned after the U.S. and the U.N. had figuratively kicked open the door. Even though this was a critical objective of U.S. policy, the findings of these inspectors were largely disconnected or ignored entirely. The findings of these inspectors were largely discounted or ignored entirely. The misstatements and distortions of the evidence by the U.S. government was noticed abroad, but mostly ignored at home. The U.S. administration disparaged the vigor and confidence of the international organizations who were monitoring Iraq's weapons of mass destruction programs. And even with strong advocacy before the UN Security Council on February 5th by the widely respected Secretary of State Colin Powell, the US could not convince the, the Council to authorize military action. We could not even convince some of our closest allies like Germany to vote for and participate in an invasion. And I will just mention parenthetically here that Colin Powell was opposed to, it, to an invasion and he was not privy to the decision on the invasion uh, in timely fashion. And yet, Powell's sense of himself as a military officer felt it was his duty to salute smartly and defend the policy with which he disagreed. And I s regard this as tragic because I think Colin Powell was probably one of the only people who could have prevented uh, our invasion of, of Iraq. But here are some specifics on, on the substance. The Iraqi military was still very weak. It never recovered from its bloody stalemate with Iran and the subsequent defeat by an alliance coalition after it invaded Kuwait. Al-Qaeda, which perpetrated the 9-11 attacks, was not an ally of Saddam Hussein, as President Bush had repeatedly asserted. Ira Iraq's nuclear weapons program was dormant. The U.S. had maintained a close watch on leading nuclear scientists who had been involved in the program we knew they were not engaged in nuclear weapons research. Energy department experts also knew that aluminum tube imports were more likely intended for manufacturing artillery rockets than for producing uranium enriching centrifuges as the CIA and DIA agreed, argued. President Bush's allegation in his January 2003 State of the Union address that Iraq was importing uranium from Africa was based on an Italian forgery. U.S. suspicions about work at facilities previously associated with nuclear weapons development were proven unjustified by the on-site observations of the returning inspectors. And then no biological weapons were being manufactured. The most alarming information on the subject came from an Iraqi engineer who had defected to Germany, offering detailed descriptions of mobile biological weapons laboratories. In December 2002, the head of German intelligence warned CIA director George Tenet in writing that Germany could not vouch for the reliability of this source. And the source's code name ironically, was curveball. Then in February 2003, facility inspections in Iraq revealed that curveball's narrative of Saddam's mobile biological weapons production capability could not be true. It just could not be reconciled with 
the previous intelligence shots they had of where immovable objects were. Uh, so Iraq no longer had significant amounts of chemical weapons. U.S. intelligence entities, including INR, had noticed before the invasion that Iraq could not document the complete destruction of its past chemical weapons production, an amount that we knew about. But the reason they couldn't document it was because they secretly destroyed it all <laughs> and, and, and kept it off the books. Uh, <laughs> and that really led to our erroneous assessment. But we also assessed that the capability, even if they had retained some chemical weapons, would not be a decision factor in a military confrontation with the U.S. And then it was later discovered that Iraq's remaining chemical weapons had actually been destroyed several years earlier. And ironically, the fact of this destruction had been conveyed to CIA interrogators by Hussein Kamal, Saddam's son-in-law, who, after heading Iraq's chemical and biological weapons programs had defected to Jordan in 1995. So there's no better source than that of someone who knew what happened to the weapons. But his confessions were discounted by the CIA and not even fully shared with other intelligence agencies. I do not remember ever encountering that in my four years of the Intelligence Bureau, which seems extraordinary to me. Also, Iraq had tested short-range ballistic missiles with ranges that were in excess of what they had been allowed. But these Iraqi violations of the limits imposed at the end of the first Gulf War were being addressed. These missiles were being destroyed under the supervision of international inspectors. So in mid-March, the destruction stopped the reason it stopped was the inspectors had to leave the country so they would not be bombed by U.S. and U.K. invaders. So the, <laughs> the international inspectors supervising these efforts were required to leave to make way for the impending invasion. So much for the evidence. When we return from break, I'll offer my final thoughts uh, and take some of your questions. And I haven't looked at my watch, but I think it's okay. I've got a, a, f a few more things to say about uh, who we should really blame for this fiasco. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have a 10-minute break. Thank you. Once again, Greg Tielman. Thank you. I think I'm still audible, right? Okay. <laughs> Well, before offering my thoughts on who was responsible for the Iraq disaster, <laughs> I want to acknowledge that uh, a few things. One is foreign policy is complicated, <laughs> and it, 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 it can't be entirely detached from domestic policy. I think we all realize that when you think about the issues. Um, also, the intelligence influencing policy is always imperfect. It's always better understood in hindsight. There's always critical things you don't know about your, the present information source, and you only find out when it's too late what, what the reality was. So I, I want to acknowledge that. I, don't, uh, I have sympathy for those who have to uh, make decisions based on imperfect information. And, and I would conclude that our policy choices are rarely the right choice and the wrong choice, but more often they are choosing the lesser of two evils. So I, I don't want to sound too naive here and uh, wishing for an entirely perfect world. I have a different view based on my personal experience about the way things work. But with these con concessions to reality, let me try to identify culprits in this uh, sad tale of, uh, of Iraq. I would say the principal blame for the invasion rests with the Bush White House. But before I even get into that, I also want to mention a co-conspirator, the British government, with whom we traditionally enjoy a special relationship. We now know that British intelligence broke the code of the U.S. invasion game plan in July of 2002. This is before the estimate was done. They did a report to Prime Minister Blair on the basis of high-level meetings in Washington each of the various agency heads met their counterpart in, in Washington. According to their memo, quote, war with Iraq was inevitable, unquote. 
and that in a campaign to justify it, quote, the intelligence and facts would be fixed around the policy. The intelligence and facts would be fixed around the policy. This extraordinarily prescient and damning document, which became known as the Downing Street Memo, was revealed in May 2005, more than two years after the invasion. It took another decade before Britain's e exhaustive official inquiry, the Chilcot Report, was released. And this report found that Tony Blair had exaggerated the case for war and decided to join the US in military action before other alternatives had been exhausted. However, it did not take the press years to figure out what was going on. And I'll see if I can advance this to one more co magazine cover. <laughs> Another meaning of WMD, <laughs> which is generally not used, but I, I, th I thought this captured well this uh, conspiracy that, that occurred. I'll take the lights again. <laughs> So let's return to, the, to those most responsible for this unnecessary war. It was the senior Bush policy officials who blurred the evidentiary basis for the different categories of weapons of mass destruction. This was the card trick I tried to expose in submitting an article to the Washington Post in January 2003. And although the lethality of nuclear weapons put them in a completely separate category from biological or chemical weapons, the WMD label made it easier to conjure up an uncontrolled nuclear threat from Iraq, and Bush exploited it. When the administration complained about Iraqi WMD violations, it was mostly voicing judgments about the chemical and biological capabilities, but it deliberately stoked public fears about Iraq's nuclear potential. NSC chief Condoleezza Rice warned of the mushroom clouds which could soon appear on the horizon. She claimed to have been unaware of the State Department's dissent on the nuclear program, even though it was included in the one-page summary of the October estimate sent to the president. And I, I've seen that one page, which doesn't have a whole lot of information on it, but it does have the rather disturbing information that the State Department's Intelligence Bureau strenuously disagreed with the most important judgment in the estimate. The characterization of Iraq's nuclear program in the 2002 estimate did not pro project a near-term threat of Iraqi nuclear weapons. Indeed, North Korea and Iran were projected to achieve nuclear weapons status sooner. Moreover, after the return of inspectors four months before the invasion, it was increasingly evident that, Iran's nuclear, that Iraq's nuclear program was dormant and the international community was in the process of destroying Saddam's ballistic missiles that could become nuclear delivery vehicles. Although these missiles were assessed to be capable of violating the 150 kilometer range limit imposed on Iraq, they were still short range weapons. And as for the aging mustard agent, which Saddam was mistakenly assessed as having, it was judged not to be a game changer, even when we thought he had some uh, stockpile. Even more egregious were efforts to harness public anger about the 9-11 attacks by implying a cooperative relationship between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. Bush called them allies. Given their actual enmity, this claim was even too much for the CIA's George Tenet, who publicly refuted this line of attack. But according to opinion polls, such rare examples of integrity did not convince the majority of Americans that Saddam was not somehow connected to 9-11. Part of the blame for the invasion goes to the press, which seemed far more interested in getting embedded with the invasion force than providing a critical look at the ongoing analysis of its rationale. Both the New York Times and the Washington Post raised prolif proliferation alarms in front page articles based on leaks from senior Bush administration officials. Their coverage simultaneously ignored or buried evidence of skepticism about the president's claims 
within the U.S. government. To its credit, the New York Times later admitted its journalistic lapses. To its discredit, the Washington Post never did. The best press coverage on Iraqi WMD came from the Philadelphia Inquirer, flagship of Knight Ritter publishing company, now McClatchy. On this subject, it outperformed both of its more widely read news sources to the north and south. In fact, I would argue that the people who counted did not read the Philadelphia Inquirer. They did read the New York Times and or the Washington Post. So blame for invasion also extends to the US Congress, the branch to which war powers were assigned by the founding fathers. The vast majority of members avoided taking a critical look at what the returning inspectors and the US intelligence officials had uncovered in the first two months of 2003. Most members of Congress resisted any further investigations of the evidence or reformulation of legislation to authorize war following the return of inspectors. And I don't know if you remember, but even in the fall, there was an effort that did not win majority support, but had substantial support of making the authorization to use force contingent on its necessity. Uh, only if Saddam would not allow the inspectors to come back in or did not allow enough engagement uh, would force be authorized. But that legislation did not pass and no one returned to it in, in the next year. The first congressional endorsement of contingent use of U.S. military force helped incentivize Baghdad to allow inspectors to return. And I had mentioned before, I think there was a constructive impact of the intelligence estimate and, and congressional uh, voting. But the Congress failed subsequently to examine in hearings the new evidence gathered since October 2002. And this failure to acknowledge the progress made in forcing compliance from a reluctant Saddam Hussein made the March 2003 invasion more likely. Great is the shame of an unnecessary war. So that's my presentation. I'd be glad to uh, hear your comments or take questions. Thank you. A brave lady in the front row. During this, this period, uh, General Kula Powell was Secretary of State. Uh, I always thought that perhaps he might be one that would uh, pursue the presidency uh, down the line, but instead he chose to kind of fade away uh, into the sunset. Do you think that part of this deception uh, plan, uh, not deception plan, but the deception of this uh, that might have been given to him impacted on that decision not to pursue any further political career? I think it might have. As I understand, Powell's wife did not want him to, to pursue the, the, the presidency. But uh, I, I really think that uh, what happened on Iraq uh, had an impact on him also. Because for one thing, he, he felt betrayed by the CIA and George Tenet. He th thought he was kind of set up. I mean, Powell uh, advised against the invasion. He was not comfortable with, with justifying it, but he was thrust forward because he was the most trusted uh, member of the administration and had the most credibility with Europeans and so forth. So he was in the hot seat. And uh, one of my personal regrets is that the people from my office uh, should have been with Powell all the time when he was at the agency. But they they weren't they they weren't invited to come. It was only Powell and his and his special assistant, and so there are like four pages of extraordinary, extraordinarily frank commentary by the analysts that used to report to me, uh, telling Colin Powell what parts of the CIA drafted speech were not justified by the evidence, and I thought this is really amazing. I mean th these folks are kind of the, the lo lowest level in the office of uh, the Intelligence Bureau, and they're writing the Secretary of State completely untethered in, in uh, they didn't mince words, and 
and uh, it looks really good, and it's completely unclassified. No one seems to know it, and it's partly because there's no, no title on the head of the pages, but it's, it's there for anyone who wants to dig it up, and you can see that these, that these uh, analysts in INR were telling the truth and, and, and spot on. And I don't know, Powell may feel, feel some guilt about not handling that portion very well either. I mean, why didn't he explicitly invite his intelligence bureau to accompany him because he spent like two or three days solid reworking the speech and, and Powell himself thought that his first draft was very bad and uh, cleaned it up considerably but it, it does not look, look very good historically speaking when we go back to it. So it's, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know how much, how, what, what part of the role it played but good question. Is this, yeah. I wanted to thank you and congratulate you for working on these things from inside to protest. I was a war protester from Vietnam through Iraq, and I just appreciate having someone who was inside doing what you could. And my question is, and it may be too broad a question to ask today, but um, did you think the invasion of Afghanistan was justified? Well, if, if you were asking uh, whether the pursuit of, uh, of the leadership of al-Qaeda was justified, I would say yes. And I mean, it was horribly bungled, of course. Uh, we, we didn't do what American soldiers should have done on the ground, which is not to uh, contract out to <laughs> to various Afghan groups hunting down al-Qaeda and uh, Osama bin Laden, rather. And uh, so I, th I think it was botched, but I, I don't really fault the uh, intervention in Afghanistan. I think it, w it was a logical follow-up to the attacks on 9-11. In fact, the Afghan government was not uh, willing to turn over uh, Osama bin Laden, the obvious uh, person responsible for the attacks. So I, I don't really have a problem with that. I do have a problem with letting Iraq distract what was going on in Iraq. So, I mean, all kinds of specialists were pulled out of Afghanistan so that we could invade uh, Iraq. And uh, that was exa exactly the wrong flow of, uh, of effort in my mind. Perpetrators of 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia, is that correct? Yeah, most of them, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> I would just say that uh, I, I appreciate your, your uh, words of appreciation for trying to do things inside government because I, I have a, a memory that still burns in my head of coming back to Grinnell College in the, in the early 1980s. This is the Reagan administration. I was working on arms control, and so I had to defend things like the Strategic Defense Initiative. And, and I, I, I thought I was doing a pretty good job of, uh, of defending U.S. policy, but still giving some hints about some of the flawed thinking. And, uh, and then I got the Grinnell Magazine reporting on my visit, and it, it interviewed, unfortunately, some of the students. And one of them said, uh, uh, a faceless bureaucrat mouthing the Reagan line. And, and <laughs> And another one said, I could learn more reading the Des Moines Register than I got from Thielman. <laughs> so I guess this has to be marked as a, not a successful visit. But, uh, it, was, uh, it gave me humility, which we were joking about uh, before. Just a couple of comments. Uh, Eisenhower warned about the industrial complex, military complex, and so forth. And there is such an organization. It's big. And it lobbies Congress and people to go in and if they don't have wars those people don't make money so uh, you know you said Congress Congress heard one side from the lobbyists too and yeah. they supported these guys so that that supports wars <laughs> it, it's a, a tricky thing and and I, I sympathize with members of Congress in one sense. I mean, uh, th th these issues can be very complicated and the classification labels add another level of complexity. And it's very hard for a member of Congress that d who relies heavily on staff to not have someone who can uh, read the classified, summarize it, present the information, but 
I know from having worked on the Senate Intelligence Committee that that uh, it, it's it's really amazing. But uh, members of Congress, in order to read top secret material, they can have someone from the Intelligence Committee come to their office, stay with the material, and not talk about it at all, <laughs> but just be uh, just a, a silent reading, and then take it back. Or the member of Congress can go to the Senate Intelligence Committee spaces and and read things there. But I also know that that uh, this this big deal national intelligence report in 2002 was read in our spaces, in the Senate Intelligence Committee spaces, by six senators. That's it. Only six had actually looked at, at that top secret page uh, <laughs> that, that, I w that I put on the screen here. And uh, that's pretty disheartening. And the good news is that uh, progress has been made in this area after the 9-11 examination and consideration of how did this happen. Uh, they instituted some structural reforms, including creating uh, 12 new positions, staff positions, for the senators who belong to the Senate Intelligence Committee, so that previously the senator had no one in their office, no one on their staff who, who could help them with the information. But now, Every member of the committee has a staff member who is both a Senate Intelligence Committee staffer and also on their personal staff. So they know how the congressman works, uh, what the congressman's uh, preferences are, and so forth. And yet they also have easy access to the classified information. So there are some things that are getting better. And uh, this, this had, had been instituted shortly before my 2004 to 2009 uh, tenure on the Intelligence Committee. but. I, I was personally persuaded that it worked very well, and it's kind of amazing that uh, nothing was done like this beforehand. But when reading about the Tonkin Gulf Resolution and, uh, and knowing that uh, 98 of the 100 senators uh, voted to support it without, it without pushing NSA to talk about, was there really a second attack? Uh, you can see that there, that there are some improvements underway contrary to all the headlines. <laughs> um, do you think uh, Colin Powell should have resigned? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I really think that, that Powell is the only person who could have averted the invasion of Iraq. That if he had resigned, it would have, it would have uh, disconcerted the leadership. They, w they would have at least delayed them themselves into further into the spring. And I think we were making such dramatic progress on Iraq and getting rid of the weapon systems and, and uh, gaining access to the things we needed to see that, that just as the heads of, uh, of the UN inspectors said at the time, we just need a little bit more time. And so I think that uh, a Powell resignation would have been such a momentous political event that it would clearly have uh, slow down the war plan, and I think it would have worked. But uh, again, I, I, I'm an admirer of Powell in a lot of ways, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't see him as one of the major culprits, but I, I am sad that he didn't, he didn't resign. I think he would have looked a lot better from history had he done that. Well, this is more of a curiosity than anything, but how much influence do you think his daddy had on on his decisions either way? Well, uh, as I was saying during the break, uh, th there's <laughs> I, I used to give presentations uh, trying to figure out what was the reason uh, for our invasion of Iraq, and uh, never mind what the official reason was, what was the real reason? And one of the five causes that I talked about was George W. Bush's personal anger at Saddam Hussein for trying to kill his father. Uh, the former president, George H.W. Bush, visited Kuwait and had kind of a hero's welcome there. But Saddam Hussein sent an assassination squad to kill him. And uh, George W. Bush didn't forgive him for that. And I think it was personal with him. He wanted to, he wanted to see Saddam uh, done in. So I don't know, you know how, that, how that can be balanced. And I, I had a theory that uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld uh, mostly wanted to have to turn Iraq into a satellite of the U.S. and have military bases there to uh, 
better control the Middle East. That was sort of his game. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz was, uh, he didn't think that there was a great case for the weapons of mass destruction, but it was something that could be easily understood by people, so that was his, his shtick. And there, there were various other motives uh, that, that uh, help explain why, even before this national intelligence estimate, uh, there was a Bush inclination to invade Iraq and finish that job that his father had botched in, in his mind, you know. He didn't move all the way through Iraq and arrest Saddam. He, he kicked the Iraqis out of Kuwait and then stopped. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an important question, but I, I don't know the psychology well enough to, to be really confident. Uh, maybe related to this, what was in it for the British? Why, from your talk, it seems like the British already made up their minds, I mean, have the facts um, support the invasion. W why, why would they do that? I think the British uh, see advantages in staying on the, on the good side of the Americans. And, uh, and I mean, they have a long history of, uh, of military involvement in the Middle East. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a foreign thing for the British government like it, it would be for, let's say, the German government. Uh, so that, that's part of it. But uh, the whole British, I mean, I was also a big fan of Tony Blair. I thought he was a really good prime minister, but he looked so bad uh, on Iraq and, and going along with things that I, I think Blair must privately have, have opposed. And yet I think Blair felt that the United States was so valuable as an ally, being such a powerful country, that he wanted to uh, be on the inside advising Bush rather than one of the troublesome Europeans on the outside. That's, that's sort of my speculation about why he would do that. Um, but but, but I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I continue to be extraordinarily impressed by the Downing Street memo that, that, that they actually, even before, I mean, th that they perceived that the U.S. had decided to go to war at a, such an early stage when Colin Powell certainly hadn't perceived that. I mean, he, he, he got evidence in January of the, uh, 2003 that that was the case, but wow. I mean, British intelligence has a good reputation, but th th this is really astounding to me that they, that they figured this out when they did. In a current... Okay, in a current headline war with uh, Israel and Hamas, we know that the U.S. position has been have you thought about what the game plan is after the war? And we've been pressing Netanyahu on that particular point. How did that vision of what it was going to look like after the invasion of Iraq enter into anybody's consideration? You, you indicated some of the players had a, a particular view of what the Middle East should look like. But uh, was there this general over-optimism that you could plant a democracy anywhere? Or how would you characterize it? <laughs> It's really hard to figure out. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I know that the, like the State Department experts who you would have thought would be the most knowledgeable about how to do this were basically disregarded. The, the, the Pentagon was in charge, and, uh, and Rumsfeld was com significantly underestimating the number of, uh, of the, the number of soldiers that would be needed. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, faulty assumptions being made that you would think any expert in the, r in the area would, would reject, but I, d I just perceive at the time that the State Department wasn't very influential. Uh, even though Paul Bremer, who was sort of the guy on the ground, was from the State Department, he also was the one who made the decision to disband the Iraqi military, which was a horrible blunder at the time, and uh, led to all kinds of additional problems. So. I'm, I'm not enough of an Iraq expert to answer your question fully, Jack, but that's my, that, that's a, f a few parts of my reaction. You know, the, the most knowledgeable people in the U.S. government were not in charge of, of the issue. And uh, if you just look at the, the, the time frame of some of the appointments, you know, it, it, it was really as if this was a last minute thing and not carefully planned out. And one would have thought if the U.S. had made the decision the previous summer, that they would really be up and running and, uh, and all over the map, but they, but they clearly weren't. And then you had people like 
Ken Edelman, that Grinnell graduate, saying that uh, it will be a cakewalk into Iraq, which did not help matters. I think a good many people, many people agree with you that Colin Powell should have resigned. Well, I appreciate hearing that. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a criticism of Colin Powell, even though it's, it's partly an acknowledgement, at least from my part, I'm just answering the question, would we have been better off? And to me, it's an easy question, yes. And uh, I, I would just say in Powell's defense that George Marshall, who's another giant in, in the U.S. Uh, security policy, and he was Secretary of State also, that he had the same attitude about saluting smartly once you got the order. I mean, doing everything you can behind closed doors to argue for your policy, which Powell did, but once the decision has been made and, and publicized to uh, salute and, and do it. And we don't have the tradition that other countries have of, of uh, senior figures resigning. I mean, Cyrus Vance did. He was one of the only people I can, I can think of. But, uh, you know, the uh, foreign, mi foreign minister of Britain resigned when the Argent Argentinians uh, invaded the Falklands. Uh, he wasn't, it wasn't his fault, but he kind of saw that as his duty to resign because it was a failure, a big failure in policy, and he was the foreign minister of Britain. So it's, it's partly a question of, of traditions, and uh, I wish we had a little bit more of a tradition of resigning in protest, but we, we really don't. Thank you, Greg, very much for the insider's account. Um, I do have a question. I mean, in some cases, the United States officials uh, were intentionally misinforming Congress and the public. Um, it seems to me to be almost a malfeasance dereliction of duty. Some of these things became known only considerably after the two wars. Both wars are, it's good to put both Vietnam and uh, Iraq together. And the question is, uh, were there any serious attempts made to call these officials to account for what they had done? That's a good question, and I, I th nothing is occurring to me <laughs> as a calling to account for these officials, I mean, the, the ways democracies do this is to defeat people who are running for election when they've, they've made blunders or s serious mistakes. And yet, uh, Bush, I, I think, beat Kerry by a, a, a comfortable margin, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and the election was enough time removed from Iraq that everyone could see that Iraq was becoming a disaster and that the original justification wasn't really accurate, and yet I don't see anyone being held responsible for that. And even even uh, some of the lower level officials, there, there was one particularly uh, irresponsible member of the CIA who I remember having in our office giving us a briefing on something, and uh, uh, he was downright deceptive in, in uh, making trips, working on Iraqi nonproliferation and then not honestly reporting what he was hearing from foreign governments. And he was not even penalized. I mean, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think he went to Oak Ridge, but <laughs> he, he, uh, his career was certainly not, not ended, uh, and he uh, did not suffer what I thought someone who, who uh, not just made mistakes, but uh, came close to criminal mistakes should have merited. What's your, or what's your uh, opinion about classification and how much classification goes on in the U.S. government? I hear, you know, I see things, people saying we're, we're much over-classified, and um, they're the, both Biden and Trump have had problems with classified materials <laughs> ending up in their own possession. Um, what do you think about classification in the government? <laughs> That's a complicated issue, <laughs> and I, 
I can give you some opinions, but I'll probably contradict myself. Uh, I, I have sympathy for the, the classification that is done. And my, my usual reaction when, when some uh, enlisted man or, or airman uh, gives a, a whole lot of uh, classified information out to the public, well, let me back up. Uh, I, I remember the, uh, the, the, the soldier who provided all kinds of State Department cables, which are mostly confidential cables, but in, in my understanding of that episode, uh, a whole lot of, of sensitive relationships were destroyed by that release because a lot of the confidential cables are simply uh, honest conversations between an American Foreign Service officer and a, and a, a foreign or maybe, let's say, a foreign ministry official or uh, some politician in the country. And they, are, they have the, the ground rules for the conversation is that this will not be publicized. And when it later appears in the press, then that's a betrayal of the, of the conversation and the ground rules. And so that's just one State Department example of, uh, of the damage that can be done. But uh, th there are other examples uh, on the defense side on very technical things where, let's say, w we can uh, have very unusual access to sensitive communications from a potential adversary. That's a really important thing to be able to maintain and that requires a very high level of, of clearance. And so I, I, I don't have much sympathy for the people who want to uh, release massive amounts of classified material. Having said that, I, I think we could do a lot better at uh, providing automatic declassification of things that uh, are, are not sensitive over time. And uh, I think that's a hard thing to do. The, the bureaucracy doesn't like to let let things go and get released to the public when there are still people alive who, who might be able to, to be hurt or engage on the issue. So, so it's complicated. I think we, we need to have uh, less things classified, more things, uh, more things automatically declassified uh, after a certain passage of time. But I would only take that so far, and I, I don't think I would be comfortable in saying we, we massively overclassify documents. I don't think that's the case. A somewhat different question rather than on that precise period. Considering the structure of the State Department and intelligence services and the transition between administrations. How much of the decision making or continuation of policy transfers over rather than political statements we're going to leave Vietnam by a presidential candidate, and then three years later, we're still in Vietnam. So it's obvious, at least to me, that there are political approaches to the policies. My concern is, within the system, is there a more consistent movement of policy rather than the extremes that we hear on the political horizons? I'm not sure if I can answer that yes or no, but I recognize the problem you're talking about. And uh, it's, it's funny how, <laughs> in the, from the State Department point of view, you make every effort to make uh, U.S. foreign policy consistent between uh, administrations. And that means you, you sometimes uh, shade things in a way that uh, you, the, the, the press certainly shouldn't or members of Congress shouldn't if there's a dramatic difference between from one day to the next. I can't quite imagine what it would be like uh, if Trump became president again, for example, but I can guarantee the State Department would try to make it sound like this is not a, a really big deal. There's continuity in policy. You know, you can still count on the U.S. as an ally. And they would say all those things, even though they might not necessarily believe it. <laughs> and uh, there, there are certainly other other departments of government who uh, who have a 
a consistent uh, bias in one direction that may be inconsistent with some uh, incoming president, and uh, they're they're uh, not necessarily dutiful soldiers uh, following the the new leadership. You know, they they drag their feet and do all kinds of things that are not constructive. When we have a, an election, we have new appointments for heads of departments, but how much uh, change is made in, in, in the course of that changeover w within the membership of the, de of the department? Was your job uh, at risk uh, when a new uh, president came into being? No, I was never successful enough uh, in a career-wise <laughs> career to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> but the, the general answer to the question is it's, it's getting worse and worse. I mean, it used to be, and I'm sp speaking mostly with State Department that I have most knowledge about. It used to be that, well, maybe uh, uh, the Under Secretary of State or the uh, the heads of some of the bureaus might change, but it certainly wouldn't uh, create dramatic changes. And most of these positions were reserved for career Foreign Service officers. But more and more, it's becoming more and more politicized. And even when, and I say that even when I like the politics of the administration, there's less respect for uh, for the careerism than there, than there used to be. And I think that's unfortunate. Uh, I, I like to remember the, uh, I mean, part of the advantage of, of the State Department's Intelligence Bureau is its small size in comparison to the CIA or DIA, and the fact that a lot of people in the Bureau have been foreign service officers, as I was, going into the Bureau. So they've actually been in the country that they're a analyzing. And and that makes a difference, too. And I, one of my favorite examples is uh, a, a friend who was uh, the Consul General in uh, in Leningrad, no, no longer Le Leningrad, but uh, uh, he he was uh, had meetings with a sort of obscure and not very well-known a Russian uh, who was number two in the administration of that city, and that person's name was Vladimir Putin. So when when Putin became prime minister of, uh, of Russia, the CIA threw like two dozen analysts at it, you know, bright people uh, working in the Russian section, and the State Department had this one guy who actually knew Putin uh, providing a profile of what he was like. So to me, that's kind of a good good uh, advertisement for, for the value of careerism uh, within, within departments. We've had the opportunity to welcome Josh Paul here in Grinnell since his resignation from the State Department. And um, I'm thinking about the opportunity you might have someday to advise persons who are in sensitive responsibility. What do's and don'ts would you give to people who find themselves in a position of having a minority perspective in your work environment? Yeah, well, I've got admiration for Josh Paul because it's it's contrary to, uh, I mean, most people don't do that. And uh, he, he did it in a way he didn't defect to another country and provide a lot of classified information. He did it in a more or less honorable way, it seems to me. And so I admire that. And there are a few examples uh, of reactions to U.S. policies, uh, which in the case of Iraq, for example, there's a career foreign service officer who was the political counselor in, in Athens who, who I actually knew. And uh, he resigned in protest and ended up providing his uh, rationale on the front page of the New York Times, which is kind of a big, big uh, payback or, or a a big influencer uh, if you're going to do this. Uh, and there were a couple of other people who resigned that I actually actually knew, but it's very hard to do and there are all kinds of reasons not to. I mean, it's, it, it's much easier to move, move away from, from that area of work. Like there was a point at which if I just wanted to think in career enhancement terms, I should have gone into Central America under Reagan because there were a lot of opportunities for the State Department to have positions that they didn't necessarily have before, but I didn't agree with the policy, so I made sure I didn't go into that to that uh, area of work. Uh, 
but it's it's a, a a tough issue and it's hard to come up with a formula about how one does it and how one doesn't but uh I know in my case I didn't even re resign in protest I had to sometimes correct members of the press to say no I resigned on my own schedule it's just that I was m a little bit more uh eager to talk about it than some people after I was no longer in the office um so it's an interesting issue <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, Greg Tielman. You're welcome. We appreciate you giving us a reliable behind the scenes glimpse into our government's decision to invade Iraq and the inaccurate rationale behind that decision. We look forward to seeing everyone next Wednesday, March 13th, when the bucket course will be presented by Jim Kessler and Effie Hall, Advocates for, of Biodiversity and Native Plant Habitats. Their course is entitled Restoring Life and Hope, Biodiversity, Mind, Body, and Spirit. So we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Barb.